Thank you, Rudy. Um, so I would like to, again, welcome all of you to this open session of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research meeting. Um, that includes both my NHGRI colleagues who are joining me here in this conference room and also uh, those of you who are watching remotely. And as with the rest of the open session, my director's report is being video recorded and that recording will be made available as a permanent archive on NHGRI's website, genome.gov. If you are new to our council meetings and my director's report, I wanna make you aware of an electronic resource that has been developed for my director's report. It's analogous to a supplemental's materials of a published paper. Um, and you can access this resource at the URL shown on the bottom of the slide. Now, the slides that I show during my director's report are also available electronically at the site, uh, made available both as the original PowerPoint slides as well as in PDF format. When there are documents or relevant websites associated with a particular slide, we annotate that with a document number indicated on the bottom right of the slide shown there. And that document number will reference material that can be accessed or downloaded at the, the website shown here. And this dedicated web page and all the linked documents are archived on genome.gov as part of a historical record of this council meeting. Now, there's gonna be a number of other presentations during the open session of this council meeting. My director's report is tailored around those presentations, so I'll try to avoid spending much time on topics that others are gonna cover. Following my director's report, uh, Vince Bonham, who's NHGRI's acting deputy director, will speak about building a diverse genomics workforce action agenda, going over the implementation plan and giving us a progress report. And then after lunch, there'll be something new. Loretta Schools, who's a program specialist in NHGRI's training diversity and health equity office, will present something new here, the Outstanding Awards for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility, or DEIA, in the genomics workforce. This will actually be followed by a moderated discussion that I will lead with the awardees. But then we really get to work, because after those presentations, there's gonna be five concept clearances presented by NHGRI extramural program staff. First, Dave Kaufman is gonna present a concept clearance on the LC program announcements for R01, R03, and R21 applications. Second, Nicole Lockhart will present a concept clearance on the Center for LC Resources and Analysis. Third, Lucia Hindorf will present a concept clearance on the Diversity Action Plan. Fourth, Christina Chang will present a concept clearance on advancing genomic medicine research. And last, but by no means least, Adam Felsenfeld will present a concept clearance on the Human Genome Reference Program. But wait, there'll be more, because following that, there'll be three reports from working groups of this advisory council, and we do ask working groups to give reports uh, roughly once a year. So first, Terry Manolio is gonna present Genomic Medicine Working Group of Council and update of meetings, activities, and accomplishments. That will be followed by Council Member Mark Craven, who will present the G Genomic Data Science Working Group of Council update. And lastly, Maya Sabatello and Greta Godo will present the Community Engagement and Genomics Working Group of Council update. So that's the plan for the rest of the open session. Um, but first, I'm gonna walk our way through these seven areas, um, which have for now, over a decade, provided a useful framework for reviewing all the relevant topics to cover in a director's report. And I will start first with NHGRI updates. And this is really a, a, a sign, uh, you're gonna see this twice in director's report, a sign of where NHGRI is in our life cycle because we have retirements. So after nearly 30 years in NHGRI's LC research program, Joy Boyer retired in December. Joy was the rock of the LC research program and a pioneer who helped shape this innovative area of science. She was a role model to our extramural research program with a style and wisdom that was widely admired. As ELSI's longest serving program director, Joy influenced and helped grow the field of ELSI research. As Joy prepared to retire, we heard from current and former trainees, along with investigators at various stages in their career, about the positive impact that Joy had on their work and their career trajectories. After an over 30-year career at NIH, Elise Feingold retired in December. 
Elise joined NHGRI in 1992, when it was still the National Center for Human Genome Research. She made numerous contributions that effectively guided the evolution and growth of NHGRI's extramural research program. Most notably, Elise was the critical program, uh, one of the pr critical program leaders for the ENCODE project. More recently, she served as the scientific advisor for strategic implementation in the Division of Genome Sciences. Elisa's professionalism, strategic vision, and humor have always been appreciated by NIH staff, grantees, and applicants. And Elisa's retirement actually did not take her too far, as she actually rejoined us as a part-time contractor last month. And the last of this set of retirements, Mike Smith also retired at the end of last year following a distinguished career at NIH. Before joining NHGRI, Mike spent 20 years at the National Cancer Institute developing genomic technologies and researching conditions such as kidney failure, HIV, AIDS, and diabetes. For the past 10 years, though, Mike served as a program director at NHGRI, focusing on technology development and coordination of the small business program. Throughout his time at the Institute, Mike has been known for his enthusiasm for science, his considered approach to program management, and his dedication to working with extramural grantees. So our thanks and best wishes for these three extramural program directors who have retired. Other changes include uh, one related to Ken Wiley, who's a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine, who has accepted a new position at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. During his nearly nine years at NHGRI, Ken has led our clinical informatics efforts and managed an extensive portfolio of projects related to pharmacogenomics, epigenomics, and clinical informatics. And we wish him all the best in his new role at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. New to NHGRI, Temis Jin Fufa joined the Division of Genome Sciences as, of Genome Science as a program director last fall. Until recently, he served as a staff scientist in the National Eye Institute, where he worked on stem cell differentiation, functional genomics, and multiomics to elucidate the mechanisms of developmental diseases. One of his primary responsibilities as NHGRI is to serve as the Division of Genome Sciences representative on the extramural training team. He's also part of an NIH program leadership team for the multiomics for disease and health and disease program that will launch this coming summer and holds a portfolio of awards focused on technology development for protein sequencing. Of note, he actually completed his postdoctoral research at NHGRI in the intramural laboratory of Bill Paven. And it's great to have him back at the Institute now as an extramural program director. So let me move on to some general NIH updates. And I'll start with something seismic. So in truly seismic NIH, well, actually it's world news, Tony Fauci retired from federal service at the end of last year. Tony was truly an icon at NIH, having worked here for 50 years and having served as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, or NIAID, for 38 years. He advised seven U.S. presidents regarding infectious disease threats, including HIV, AIDS, and most recently COVID-19. Hugh Ausenkloss, Austin, who is currently NIAID's principal deputy director, is now serving as the Institute's acting director while a search for the next director is conducted. Well, OK, wait a second. I, I can't let the departure of Tony Fauci from NIH be represented by a single slide. And so I inserted another one. Uh, Tony is almost himself an institution. He represents the best of scientists and clinicians engaged in public service. He has had an impact on all of us through our recent experiences with COVID-19. And um, in my opinion, uh, the NIH will not be the same without him. Uh, that said, I consider it an honor and a privilege to have served as a fellow institute director with Tony for 13 years and one month of his 38 years as an institute director himself. I cherished every moment of his mentorship and his friendship. And I am pleased to report that Tony plans to continue advancing science and public health in his ongoing and future endeavors. And from what I can tell, over the last month or so, he has not slowed down uh, one bit. Other retirements, uh, Roger Glass will actually retire tomorrow from federal service, stepping away from his positions as deputy, as director 
of the Fogarty International Center and NIH Associate Director for International Research, having held both positions since March of 2006. As the longest serving director of the Fogarty International Center, Roger broadened NIH's global health footprint, partnering with all the NIH institutes and centers, including NHGRI, to advance global health research in support of NIH's mission. Fogarty's deputy director, Peter Kelmartz, will serve as the acting director while a search for the next director is conducted. More retirements. In December, Andrea Norris retired from her positions as director of the NIH Center for Information Technology, or CIT, and NIH's chief information officer. For more than a decade, she led a $1.6 billion technology portfolio that supports the research of NIH's 27 institutes and centers, as well as researchers at more than 2,500 universities and medical centers across the country that receive NIH funding. Ivor D'Souza has been selected to serve as the acting director of CIT, while Dennis Papala has been selected to serve as the acting director of, NIH, of the NIH Office of the Chief Information Officer and NIH is launching searches for both of these positions in the very near future. And yet more, John Gallen will retire from federal service in March. He currently serves as the NIH Associate Director for Clinical Research and Chief Scientific Officer of the NIH Clinical Center. John's career at NIH spans more than 50 years, during which he has played an instrumental role in developing the research portfolio for the NIH Clinical Center. And among John's many contributions, his most significant one was serving as the 10th director of the NIH Clinical Center, a position he held from 1994 to 2017, making him the longest serving clinical center director. Later this month, Adrian Hallett will depart from her role as NIH Associate Director for Legislative Policy and Analysis. Adrian joined NIH in May of 2015 and has led NIH's engagement with both chambers of Congress for the past eight years, during which, by the way, NIH's appropriations have grown by more than 40%. Upon departing from NIH, she will become the Vice President of Global Policy and Strategic Initiatives at Cambrian Biopharma, Inc. Lauren Higgins, the current Deputy Director under Adrian, will serve as the Acting Associate Director until a permanent replacement is identified. Okay, with all those retirements, we must have appointments coming in. We certainly do. So in November, Nina Shore was appointed the NIH Deputy Director for Intramural Research. She actually had been serving in that role in an acting capacity since August, uh, following the departure of Michael Gottesman from that position. The NIH Deputy Director for Intramural Research leads the broader NIH Intramural Research Program, which involves researchers and clinicians from 24 of NIH's 27 institutes and centers. And then in November, Joni Rutter became the director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. She had served as NCATS's acting director since April of 2021. And in this role, Joni will oversee a diverse portfolio of research activities focused on improving the translational process of turning scientific discoveries into health interventions. In terms of some policy activities, the new NIH Data Management and Sharing, or DMS, policy went into effect in late January. Under this policy, investigators applying to NIH for funding must submit a DMS plan outlining how the resulting scientific data and any accompanying metadata generated by the funded project will actually be managed and eventually shared with the research community. Once funded, the award recipients are expected to comply with the DMS plan approved by the funding institute or center as essentially a term and condition of the award. A designated NIH website for this new policy, which is sharing.nih.gov, sharing.nih.gov, has a wealth of useful information and guidance to assist them with plan preparation. Now, meanwhile, NHGRI has also been active in preparation for implementing the new policy and in preparing and in providing NHGRI specific guidance to applicants. Specifically, we have updated our data sharing policy website on genome.gov with guidance on where to share scientific data generated with NHGRI funding. And then additionally, we, we along with several other NIH institutes and centers have generated sample DMS plans to help investigators get started. 
Well, given the generally strong commitment of genomics researchers to genomic data sharing, we are confident that our research community is well poised to craft thoughtful and comprehensive DMS plans. On another topic, research collaborations among institutes and centers are crucial for achieving many of NIH's goals. We found it interesting that a new report from the NIH Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives revealed that NHGRI is the second highest institute or center among the 27 with respect to inter-institute center research collaborations. And this was based on data covering fiscal years 2019 to 2021. Specifically, 33 to 36% of NIH, NHGRI's budget in those fiscal years was involved in such collaborative efforts. Notice that the overall average was, you know, maybe half of that, um, an average of about 17 to 18%, which really illustrates the incredible degree to which our institute pursues collaboration efforts across the NIH, something that I am certain will continue to be the case going forward. In August of 2022, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or otherwise known as OSTP, issued a memorandum to federal departments and agencies stating that by December 31st of 2025, publications and their supporting data resulting from federally funded research must be made publicly accessible without an embargo upon their free and public release. Now, the OSTP guidance will end the current optional embargo, which allows scientific publishers to put taxpayer-funded research behind a subscription-based paywall. Additionally, the policy requires that agencies develop plans to improve transparency, including clearly disclosing authorship, funding, affiliations, and the status of federally funded research. This policy change was catalyzed in part by the COVID-19 pandemic, during which publishers agreed to make COVID-19-related papers open access. This represented a shift in practice during the public health crisis. In 2020, OSTP estimated that federal funds support 7 to 9% of the 2.9 million, million papers published worldwide that year. This guidance is then expected to have substantial impact on the scientific publishing landscape. And then I thought perhaps of general interest to many of you, two weeks ago, the journal Science published a policy forum that details the NIH-led research response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The paper emphasizes that by building on decades of basic and applied research and convening all sectors in a highly collaborative fashion, NIH and its partners were able to quickly develop vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, the paper details the crucial lessons that were learned that will inform the public health research response for in future pandemics. By the way, the paper also included a very informative timeline that showcases the key milestones in developing COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, and public outreach. And lastly, for this category, on December 29th, President Biden signed a massive fiscal year 2023 omnibus appropriations bill into law. The bill included a 5.6% budget increase for NIH. NHGRI specifically received a 3.8% increase, which, which brought our total funding to $663 million in this current fiscal year, 2023. This 3.8% increase was actually higher than the initial proposals that came from the House and the Senate, with such an increase always appreciated. So moving on to some general genomics updates. Starting with David Alice, a molecular biologist whose research greatly advanced our scientific understanding of how proteins interact with genes sadly passed away recently in January. He was 71 years old. David's discoveries reshaped knowledge of the genetic on-off and volume switches in gene expression. He was a professor and researcher at Rockefeller University from 2003 until last year. Barbara Majan, a genetics pioneer who spent over 60 years working at Johns Hopkins University, passed away also in January. She was 91. Barbara's research focused on X inactivation, the process by which one of the two X chromosomes is turned off in female mammals. She was the sixth female to become a professor at Johns Hopkins University, receiving that promotion in 1978. A good friend of NHGRI is Jeremy Farrar, has been selected to be the next chief scientist of the World Health Organization, or WHO. 
Jeremy is highly accomplished as a physician scientist, and, but most recently he has served as director of the Wellcome Trust since 2013. A strong advocate for all things genomics, Jeremy will join the WHO in the second quarter of 2023. We were all happy when the Nobel Assembly awarded the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine to Svante Pablo for his discoveries about the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. Svante revolutionized the use of cutting edge genomic technologies to create the field of ancient DNA research. He is currently director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. And Nobel Prizes, I think, as you know, are awarded to those who have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. So congratulations to him. Similar congratulations goes out to this awardee, because the 2022 Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award was given to physician scientist uh, Dennis Lowe of the Chinese University of Hong Kong for his work in advancing the analysis of fetal DNA and maternal blood. This seminal research led to the now routine use of non-invasive prenatal genetic testing for aneuploidies. An Alaska DeBakey Award is given to honor outstanding work that contributes to the understanding, diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and cure of diseases. Other honors relate to the National Academy of Medicine, who recently selected um, or announced the election of new members and of particular relevance to the genomics community or to NIH and or to our institute are the individuals listed here. Congratulations to each of them. And then similarly, there's an impressive list of genetics and genomics researchers, including NHGRI colleagues who were recently elected to be fellows of the American Association for Advancement of Science, with their names listed here. In November, the American Society of Human Genetics, or ASHG, released the Human Genetics and Genomics Workforce Survey Report, which was developed with NHGRI funds and created in partnership with the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the National Society of Genetic Counselors. The report summarizes the first of its kind in-depth look at the workforce demographics of the genetics and genomics field. And the report lays out important groundwork for future assessment and action. Now, over 4,000 members of the Genetics and Genomic Societies participated in the survey. 67.7 of respondents identified their race, ethnicity, or ancestry as white, and 73.3% identified as US citizens. Note that women made up the majority of respondents, specifically 74.7%. Genetic counseling, research, and academics were the top primary areas of work for employed respondents. Now, NHGRI hosted a webinar with report partners in December to explore the key findings from the report and to define next steps. And more than 150 people attended the webinar in real time. And if you missed that discussion, the webinar was recorded and can be viewed on NHGRI's website, genome.gov. In other ASHG news, on January 24th, the American Society of Human Genetics, which is the largest and among the most distinguished professional societies in human genetics, publicly apologized for the strong support of, sci of scientific racism and eugenics by past senior leadership, including several past presidents. An essential element of that apology was the acknowledgement by ASHG that it should have done more to combat the misuse of genetic findings for eugenic and racist ends. Importantly, ASHD announced that it will remove the names of people from the titles of its professional awards pending further review of whether those individuals had any past associations with eugenics and scientific racism. This public apology was one of a series of immediate actions taken by ASHG in response to their 27-page Facing Our History, Building an Equitable Future Initiative report. This report and an accompanying ASHG statement is now online and carries with it a renewed commitment to build equity and inclusion within ASHG's membership and among its leadership, to rebuild trust with the scientific community and the public, and finally, to ensure that the grave errors of the past are not repeated. And now for some honors related to ASHG. ASHG gives awards to four members of the genomics community or gave awards uh, at its 2022 annual meeting. Peter Donnelly received the William Allen Award, which recognizes a scientist for substantial and far-reaching scientific contributions to human genetics. Heidi Rem received the Kurt Stern Award, which recognizes genetics and genomics researchers who have made significant scientific contributions during the past decade. 
David Nelson received the Victor A. McCusick Award, which recognized an individual who has exhibited exemplary leadership and vision in advancing ASHG's mission through the promotion and successful assimilation of genetics and genomics knowledge into the broader scientific community. And Amir Kenny received the Early Career Award, which recognizes the contributions of genetics and genomic scientists in the first 10 years as an independent investigator. Congratulations to those good friends and colleagues. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, or NASEM, has convened an ad hoc committee to conduct a two-year consensus study to assess the scientific and technological breakthroughs, workforce, and infrastructure needed to directly sequence RNA in all of its modifications, for example, the epitranscriptome, and to understand the role RNA modifications play in biological processes and disease. The study is sponsored by the Warren Alpert Foundation, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and NHGRI. And as part of this study, the committee will hold a public workshop on March 14th and 15th of this year. The Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH, is dedicated to responsible sharing of genomic and clinical data by developing technical standards and policy frameworks and facilitating their uptake in diverse research and healthcare settings. Now, the GA4GH held its 10th plenary meeting in September 22 in Barcelona, Spain. At that meeting, five new board members were introduced, extending international representation in Africa and Asia and Latin America. GA4GH driver projects are genomic data initiatives that help guide GA4GH standards development and pilot their implementation in real world projects. Currently, NIH supports or contributes to 11 of the 24 GA4GH driver projects. GA4GH has opened a call for new driver projects and seeks to build larger strategic partnerships. And finally, the GA4GH Assigned Expert Program is a pilot to engage technical experts from a broad range of projects around the world. NIH has funded the first dedicated GA4GH engineer of this program through the NIH Common Fund DSI Africa program led by Nikki Mulder at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. The Global, Ally the Global Biodata Coalition, or GBC, is a forum for research funders to coordinate and share approaches for the efficient management and growth of biodata resources worldwide. The GBC aims to stabilize and ensure sustainable financial support for the global biodata infrastructure. And I'm pleased to report that after a rigorous two-round selection process involving international reviewers, the GBC announced the first set of Global Core Biodata Resources, or GCBRs, in December. Now, GCBRs are biodata resources of fundamental importance to life sciences around the world and the long-term preservation of biological data. And of the 37 resources selected and designated as GCBRs, 16 of them are funded by NHGRI. The International Common Disease Alliance, or ICDA, is a scientific consortium that aims to find barriers to progress in, um, in tackling its signature maps to medicine, to mechanisms to medicines challenge, also to identify opportunities for new projects and also to facilitate international collaborations. Now, ICDA held its third scientific plenary meeting this past December. The meeting featured talks by leaders from academia and industry and highlighted innovative proposals conceived by the core ICDA working groups. Each of these proposals is focused on moving from maps to mechanism to medicine at scale, meaning that they are designed to move the needle on our understanding of how genetic variation affects biological systems and contributes to risk for human disease, with the ultimate goal of informing medical practice. Now, to learn more about ICDA and about the proposals featured at the scientific plenary meeting, I would encourage you to visit the ICDA website and view the recordings that have now been uploaded to YouTube. Now for some end of, 22, end of 2022 accolades. Now, although the science breakthrough of the year went to the James Webb Space Telescope, there were two runners-ups that, that would be of particular interest to the genomics community. Uh, they were Black Death's legacy detected in the genes of Europeans and the ancient ecosystem reconstructed from two million year old DNA, uh, both of which I think you would admit are super cool advances. 
And late last year, Nature named 10 people who helped shape science in 2022, and one of those was Alondra Nelson, who is the Deputy Director uh, for Science and Society in the US Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, but of note to this council, I would point out that Alondra was also previously a member of the Genomics and Society Working Group of this council. And the last set of end of year accolades, the scientists' top 10 innovations of 2022 included a machine to sequence the genome for $100, instruments for single cell analysis, tools for non-invasive prenatal testing, and a 3D view of gene expression. So let me now move on to NHGRI's extramural research program. We'll start with the Human Genome Reference Program, or HGRP, which represents NHGRI's continued commitment to refining and maintaining the reference human genome sequence. The program, which is in its fourth year, aims to generate at least 350 high-quality reference human genome sequences and incorporate these data into a pan-genome reference for the research community. Data generated with multiple DNA sequencing platforms reflecting phased diploid genome sequences from 150 individuals have now been released and are available for download from multiple repositories. Now, the annual HPRC meeting was held in October of 2022 and featured updates on sample selection and collection, embedded ethical, legal, and social applications researches, research, and changes in DNA sequence production costs. The meeting also covered pan-genome reference representations, outreach, and international collaborations. NHGRI hosted a separate planning meeting the day after the main meeting to consider next steps for the HPRC program and note that a concept stemming from this meeting will be presented this afternoon in the open session. The Genomics Research Enhances Genetics of Rare Diseases, or GREGOR Consortium, aims to significantly increase the proportion of identified genetic causes of Mendelian disease through enhanced data sharing, collaboration, and a strong focus on the application of new technologies, DNA sequencing strategies, and analytical approaches. In November 2022, the Gregor Consortium held its first in-person meeting with over 140 participants. The meeting's key themes were networking and collaboration. Poster sessions, panel discussions, and lunch groups helped to foster connections among consortium members. The meeting included a session on the major challenges to solving the genetic causes of Mendelian disorders, as well as a session on collaborations with projects that could be performed across Gregor Research Centers, as well as with other related consortia. The impact of genomic variation on function, or IGVF, aims to develop a framework for systematically understanding the effects of genomic variation on genome function and how these effects shape phenotypes in health and disease. Well, this past September, IGVF members associated with the 26 awards gathered for the first consortium meeting. The meeting focused on coordinating activities across all the awardees of IGVF grants, also engaging trainees and promoting career development, fostering interactions with other consortia, and defining future goals and timelines. There were awardee and working group presentations, poster sessions, lightning talks, and a panel with guest speakers from various other consortia. Now, researchers um, who are not funded by the IGVF consortium can actually apply to join the program as affiliate members. Affiliate members can benefit from the highly interactive research environment and consortium discussions. And these members will make valuable contributions to the generation, sharing, and analysis of data. They'll also engage in consortium activities and they'll broaden their participation from the scientific community. So IGVF currently has 17 affiliate members, each contributing their unique expertise to the consortium. They span 17 different institutions with 15 sites located across the United States, as shown here, as well as two um, sites in Europe. If you see the NHGRI AGVF website, you will find a full list of affiliate members, as well as information about how to apply for affiliate membership. And the deadline to apply for affiliate membership is actually done on a rolling basis. The National Science Foundation's Molecular Foundations for Biotechnology, or MFB, program aims to develop fundamentally new approaches in molecular sciences to drive novel directions in biotechnology. NSF and NHGRI jointly released the 2023 MFB solicitation, which is a partnership that focuses on RNA tools and biotechnology. 
The program is soliciting synergistic proposals that pursue creative technological approaches to study RNA function in complex biological systems and harness RNA research to advance biotechnology. The goal is to catalyze collaborations that integrate across biological, chemical, computational, mathematical, and physical science disciplines. And letters of intent are due March 16th, with the full proposals then being due on May 11th. The NHGRI Analysis, Visualization, and Informatics Lab Space, or ANVIL, is a federated cloud-based infrastructure and software platform that provides an analysis and computing environment for unrestricted and controlled access of genomic and phenotypic data sets. ANVIL has been piloting the Data Use Oversight System, also called DUOS. DUOS has a semi-automated service that expedites controlled data access for researchers which simplifies the oversight of the data access request process by a data access committee. Remember, data access committees are called DACs. So DUOS implements the GA4GH data use ontology, or DUO, that's where it gets the name DUO, standard, and other features to streamline receiving and managing data access requests. It facilitates browsing of data sets that can be used for a particular research purpose. DUOS also supports DACs in their review and oversight by aligning proposed projects with data use limitations of requested data sets. And by the middle of this year, DUOS will be used by NHGRI DACs, or by the NHGRI DAC, to process all data access requests for data sets that are stored in Anvil. Further innovations supporting the use of DUOS by NHGRI's DAC and potentially expanding to the DACs of other NIH institutes will be key deliverables of the Anvil. The ninth IDASH Genomic Privacy Challenge was held in November of last year with competition tasks including secure genotype phenotype prediction, analysis of single cell transcriptomics, and secure record linkage with patient data. Now, privacy algorithms used in the challenge are rapidly becoming practical in real world use. In real world use. And interestingly, the speed of homomorphic encryption, or compute time, is actually decreasing faster right now than is Moore's law. And previous IDASH challenge winners are building useful applications for genomics and health. Fast genome imputation that is fully encrypted is now available in the Open Impute server at the University of Texas Health Science Center. And another team of previous IDASH contributors has just won phase one of the UK-US privacy, privacy prize challenge in the healthcare competition. Moving on, the Clinical Sequencing Evidence Generating Research, or CSER program, aims to generate evidence of the clinical utility of genome sequencing with a major emphasis on diverse patient populations. And as CSER heads to completion this spring, its investigators have been busy publishing and presenting their work. So for example, at the 2022 ASHG annual meeting, it actually featured 10 CSER presentations, uh, one of which was a platform talk by the UCSF Program in Prenatal and Pediatric Genome Sequencing Study, or P3EGS, that showed that among 529 pediatric and 316 prenatal patients whose parents self-reported as underrepresented minority, or had URM status, and who received exome sequencing, rates of both positive diagnoses and inconclusive findings were actually similar between the URM and the non-URM children for both pediatric and prenatal exome sequencing. So these findings support the application of exome sequencing in patients from diverse populations. Another platform presentation from the Baylor Kids Can Seek study evaluated yield and utility of adding exome sequencing to a pediatric cancer panel test. Among reported results for, from 581 childhood cancer patients, less than half of the pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants were reported on both the exome sequence and panel. Exome sequencing showed a large number of results not covered by the panel, while variants unique to the panel were all found to be actionable. This finding suggests that careful optimization of combined exome sequencing and panel testing may improve utility in pediatric cancer. The Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen, evaluates and disseminates the clinical relevance of genes and genomic variants for use in precision medicine and research. Now, the number of ClinGen gene and variant curation expert panels has more than doubled since 2019, from 50 expert panels to now over 100. 
This has led to a sharp increase in the completed gene and variant curations that are freely available in the ClinGen resource, with total curations around 6,000 unique genes and variants. This exciting growth has been supported in part by the NIH institutes listed here, which have funded 15 curation expert panels in disease areas relevant to their institute's mission. And additionally, ClinGen-funded grantee institutions have developed partnerships with nonprofit and industry groups. These partners have provided funds to support bio-curators on a variety of expert panels. Each partner has agreed to ClinGen's partnership policy, which emphasizes principles such as data sharing, transparency, and no expectation of endorsement by ClinGen or NIH. The growing funding support from our sister NIH institutes and nonprofit organizations and industry contributes to ClinGen's ability to sustain this important resource into the future. The Phenotypes and Exposures Toolkit, or Phoenix, is a catalog of consensus protocols for measuring phenotypes and exposures in biomedical research. Usage of Phoenix's consensus protocols facilitates combining studies to increase statistical power, comparing studies to validate results, and increasing the impact of individual studies. Now, the Phoenix Toolkit grant was recently renewed with Carol Hamilton from RTI International as a principal investigator. Phoenix is now supported under the NIHY Trans-NIH Biomedical Knowledge Base Program funding announcement, which supports curation, annotation, and linkage of core data sets. And NHGRI will provide funding for five years with co-funding from the indicated four other institutes and centers and actually one office. And in this next phase, Phoenix aims to increase use by leveraging biomedical standards to increase scientific impact and awareness of the resource. And the active participation of our partners will facilitate wider dissemination and use of the toolkit among the NIH-funded community. And um, this December, Phoenix expanded its social determinants of health collection. Now, the expansion was achieved with significant leadership and funding from the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, along with input from a trans NIH working group. And the new social determinants of health protocols measure social factors at the individual and community levels that influence health outcomes. The expanded collection includes 15 new protocols for measures such as internet access, minimum wage, and healthcare discrimination. The Social Determinants of Health Collection is a popular resource ranked as the seventh most downloaded collection of protocols on the Phoenix website. And we expect the expanded collection to further enhance the science of minority health and health disparities while advancing a culture of scientific collaboration. The polygenic risk methods in diverse populations or prime consortium is developing methods and refining polygenic risk scores to improve the prediction of health and disease in diverse ancestry populations. To assist in their efforts, the prime consortium has received approvals from various dbGaP data access committees for over 300 data access requests. Combining these data from other publicly accessible repositories will provide primed investigators with participant data from the blue shaded areas shown on the map for their analyses. Now, the Prime Consortium actually established five working groups for tackling these range of activities. The Data Sharing Working Group focuses on developing policies and processes for sharing data. The Gen Gen Genotype Harmonization Working Group is formulating a quality control and a harmonization plan. The Methods Review Working Group assesses methods. The Phenotype Harmonization Working Group defines phenotypic data standards while working closely with the social and ethical implications a polygenic risk working group, which identifies, investigates, and responds to ethical, social, and related considerations. And finally, the Prime Consortium recently established its external scientific panel, which is a non-governing entity comprising multidisciplinary experts that will assist the NIH in assessing the Prime Consortium's activities. Moving on to our small business program, NHGRI Small Business Program continues to support innovative research and enable commercialization in genomics and genomic medicine through funding Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR, and Small Business Technology Transfer, or STTR, grants. In total, the Institute funded $16.5 million in small business grants in fiscal year 2022. And these recent SBIR and STTR grants include 19 phase one proof of principle and 11 phase two pre-commercialization awards. 
Of note, the five companies shown here have been awarded new phase two grants, Curio Bioscience for commercialization of a reagent kit for spatial transcriptomic analyses, primordial genetic, genetics for their work on a novel and efficient enzymatic process for synthesis of DNA oligonucleotides, Armonica Technologies for development of single molecule nucleic acid sequencing technology, and Deuterium for their scientific data analysis platform, and finally, Electronic Biosciences for their nanoscale tools for inosine sequencing. NHGRI's extramural training program aims to prepare a talented and diverse genomics workforce by providing both institutional and individual funding through a variety of mechanisms, including individual fellowship and career development awards, institutional awards, and diversity supplements. Programs are offered at the undergraduate, post-baccalaureate, graduate, postdoctoral, and faculty levels. Well, the extramural training program has two updates on outreach activities to attract more diverse individuals to our workforce. First, program staff participated in outreach at the 2022 Annual Biomedical Research Conference for Minority Students, or ABRAHAMS, on November 2022. And there were similar plans for participating in this and other outreach events in this current year, 2023. Also, we wanted to bring to your attention that Duke University Principal Investigator, uh, Suzanne Haga, published a conference report on the 2022 NHGRI Research and Career Development Annual Meeting. Published in Personalized Medicine, the report highlights specific programs and events that were offered to the trainees during the three-day meeting, raising its visibility to the biomedical research community. And with that, I'll transition to the NIH Common Fund and other trans-NIH efforts. Starting with uh, COMP2, so the Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Program, or COMP2, is a trans-NIH research program focused on generating a comprehensive resource of null mutant mice and their phenotype information. To date, COMP2 investigators have developed and phenotyped approximately 5,500 strains of knockout mice contributing to the more than 10,000 strains created by the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, or IMPC. Now, COMP2 launched the final phase of its program last year with co-funding from 18 institutes, centers, and offices. Awards totaling $42 million over a five-year period were made to three production centers at the University of California, Davis, the Jackson Laboratory, and Baylor College of Medicine, as well as to a data coordination center at EBI Hingston. The final phase of the program will generate an additional 1,200 mutant mice, mouse lines using CRISPR-Cas9 technology, perform a series of phenotyping assays, and then make the mice strains and data readily available to the scientific community. And lastly, COMP2 hosted its annual meeting in December of 2022. Over 240 attendees convened to discuss consortium-wide efforts, accomplishments, and goals. And the meeting featured several guest speakers, including NHGRI Council Member Len Pinocchio. And recall that the central goal of the Human Heredity and Health in Africa, or H3Africa program, has been to develop a sustainable and collaborative African genomics research enterprise. H3Africa has now completed its 10th and final year of NIH Common Fund support. We thought it was interesting to note that two weeks ago, a paper describing the accomplishments of the H3Africa program and its influence on genomics in Africa was published in the journal Nature. Aside from the incredible achievements of H3Africa that were included, the paper importantly makes the case for future genomics funding in Africa. The NIH Common Fund Human Biomolecular Atlas Program, or HubMap, aims to develop an open global framework for creating comprehensive mappings of the human body at a cellular resolution, which will help develop, to help determine how the relationships between genes affect the health of a person. HubMap has now entered its production phase, which will run during fiscal years 2022 to 2026, and will focus on building out reference data sets for more organs and modalities, integrating across different molecular and spatial resolutions, improving access to the generated data, enhancing diverse perspectives and research efforts, and establishing collaborative efforts with other programs. Now, there were 20 new awards were made in the production phase with locations across 10 different states. Uh, these include six HubMap integration visualization and engagement groups that will build the tools for integrating and visualizing data. It also includes 10 tissue mapping centers that will generate the data for generating 2D and 3D maps for multiple organs. And finally, four demonstration projects that will focus on analysis that show how the broader research community 
can benefit from HubMap data and resources. The 4D Nucleome, or 4DN, is an NIH Common Fund program that aims to study the organization of the nucleus in both space and time. Phase two launched in 2020 with a focus on understanding the role of nuclear architecture and disease and biological processes such as gene expression. So I want to highlight for you four recent publications from the 4DN program. The first involves development of a novel method that captures spatially resolved single cell epigenomic data. This method can be used to identify enhancer promoter pairs and enhancer hubs. The second is a review that highlights current challenges and opportunities in using epigenome editing screens to examine the role of nuclear architecture in disease. The third report um, discusses progress in quantitative cell fate mapping, specifically using an approach that connects cell lineage to cell fate and dynamics long after embryonic development. And the fourth is a perspective from the NIH program team that summarizes how the 4DN program started, accomplishments of phase one, and plans for phase two. And in addition to reading 4DN publications, I also encourage you to tune in to the webinars on the 4DN YouTube channel. The NIH Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation, or FIRST program, um, aims to enhance and maintain cultures of inclusive excellence in the biomedical research community through recruitment of early stage faculty. Led by the NIH Common Fund and managed in collaboration with several NIH institutes and centers, five new sites were funded in response to the most recent funding opportunity. The new awardees are Northwestern University in Chicago, University of California, San Diego, University of Maryland in Baltimore, University of New Mexico, and University of South Carolina in Columbia. The second round awardees will join the existing awarded sites in recruitment of a critical mass of early career faculty who have a demonstrated commitment to inclusive excellence. And the program also seeks to advance faculty development, retention, progression, and eventually promotion, as well as to develop inclusive environments that are sustainable. The All of Us Research Program is seeking to build a national research cohort of one million or more participants reflecting the diversity of the United States. The program is creating a partnership with participants in order to advance precision medicine and to change healthcare for the benefit of all. All of Us is now returning health-related genetic results to more than 150,000 study participants nationwide. This includes a hereditary disease risk report with information on genomic variants in the 59 medically actionable genes identified by the American College of Medical Genetics, as well as a report focused on pharmacogenomics. Participants have the option to speak to a genetic counselor to discuss and interpret the results of their genetic tests. We are also excited to announce that NHGRI is partnering with all of us and other NIH institutes and centers on two new funding opportunity announcements listed here. These solicitations are aimed at enhancing the use of all of us data in the researcher workbench and developing new tools and applications to analyze these data. And the application due date for both announcements is March 1st. And lastly, the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, or BGTC, launched in October of 2021 with an aim to improve understanding of the basic biology of vectors involved in gene delivery and to simplify regulatory requirements for gene therapies for ultra-rare diseases. The program is actually being coordinated by the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health as part of its Accelerating Medicines Partnership, sometimes referred to as the AMP program, with involvement of 12 government, 13 industry, and 10 nonprofit partners, as well as over $81 million in committed resources, and the names and logos of which are shown on the left. And now in year one of a planned six-year initiative, BGTC has selected the 14 candidate diseases that will be focused on and will be announcing the final five to six diseases later this summer. These diseases, which are sort of listed on the right, will be the targets for gene therapy efforts, including manufacturing and preclinical testing. And moving on then to NHGRI activities in the areas of communications, policy, and education. Uh, we're very proud about our recently updated and upgraded NHGRI talking glossary of genetic and genomic, uh, genomic and genetic terms. 
Uh, it now features nearly two, 250 terms explained in an easy to understand way by leading scientists and professionals in addition to providing graphics and animations for viewing and downloading. And based on data from April 2021 to January 2023, the resource has received over 18.4 million page views by viewers in 190 countries. And as a testament to the growing visibility of this resource, the journal Clinical Chemistry uh, used the glossary's nanopore DNA sequencing graphic on the cover of its December 2022 issue. And we were pleased to see that. In the past two years, the NHGRI History of Genomics program has hosted public forums to stimulate dialogue about genomics and the related potential for stigmatization and misinformation. The most recent of these events took place in January with a virtual roundtable discussion entitled The Promise and Perils of Social and Behavioral Genomics. The event attracted 900 attendees that engaged with expert panelists who addressed how the history of scientific racism in eugenics and genetics and genomics may limit the scientific community's capacity to respond decisively to the misuse and misappropriation of scientific data. Also, this past October, the program hosted a two-day virtual symposium entitled Irreducible Subjects, Disability, and Genomics in the Past, Present, and Future. And for that gathering, nearly 1,000 attendees registered for the event. Participants addressed historical and present-day constructions of disability and ableism with a focus on the history and lived experiences of people with disabilities in the context of genetics and genomics. And as always, recordings of both events can be found on our website, genome.gov. Now, since 2023, will mark the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project and the 70th anniversary of the discovery of DNA's double helical structure. Uh, this director's report archival highlight, which you may recall I started last director's report and will now always contain such an archival highlight in each of my director's reports, um, it is related to these anniversaries. So what's, what's shown here? On the left is actually a letter from President George W. Bush sent to his, where he was sending his congratulations for the successful completion of the Human Genome Project, marking a new era of medical progress. He also commemorated what was then the 50th anniversary of the discovery of DNA's double helical structure. In the center of this slide is the logo that was used uh, in April of 2023, nearly 20 years ago, um, illustrating the journey from the discovery of DNA's double helical structure in 1953 to the completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003. And lastly, on the right, is an excerpt of the Senate concurrent resolution that designated April of 20, 2003 as Human Genome Month and April 25th of every year going forward as National DNA Day. This resolution, which was in large part due to the work of the late Representative Louise Slaughter, was a means to commemorate the successful completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003 and the discovery of DNA's iconic structure, the double helix, in 1953. So I just mentioned to you uh, that 2023 is going to be an energetic and a spirited and a celebratory year. So please put on your seatbelts because NHGRI will be leading efforts to engage the genomics community in celebrating three anniversaries this year, the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project, 70th anniversary of the discovery of DNA's double helical structure, and the 20th anniversary of National DNA Day. To commemorate these anniversaries, NHGRI will hold a symposium on National DNA Day, April 25th, highlighting relevant and interesting topics in genomics and concluding with the annual Louis M. Slaughter National DNA Day Lecture, now an annual event. And the symposium agenda and the guest lecture will be announced soon. And follow us on social media and check the National DNA Day webpage for the most up-to-date information. So a busy 2023, but wait, wait, there will be more? Because remember, when I gaveled this open session together, I said this was the 98th meeting of this council. So yes, just wait for it, because the 100th such gathering of this amazing group will happen this year. We will also celebrate that anniversary as when we all gather for the September council meeting. And yes, I will promise you now, you can expect cake and balloons and maybe even some genome songs. It will be quite the celebration, so look forward to the September council meeting of this coming year. 
Well, the NHGRI Office of Communications released materials for audiences to learn about the different ways that artificial intelligence and machine learning are being used at NHGRI and in genomics research. This included a feature story and accompanying video about three NHGRI intramural investigators who use these technologies to characterize genomic disorders and to communicate genomic risk. NHGRI also held a live Twitter Q&A with Spencer Hong from Northwestern University, and Spencer uses machine learning to actually analyze the materials in NHGRI's history archive, which contains over two million pages of documents pertaining to the history of genomics in NHGRI. And machine learning tools help to analyze those documents much, much faster than a human can. Another exciting area of NHGRI research was recently uh, got a lot of, of press attention thanks to our communications group. Um, the credit scientifically goes uh, to Elaine Ostrander's laboratory because by analyzing DNA samples from over 200 dog breeds along um, with nearly 50,000 pet owner surveys, researchers in Elaine's laboratory have pinpointed some of the genes associated with the behaviors of specific dog breeds. And their study, which was published in the journal Cell in December, suggested that behavior, not just appearance, has helped qualify these dogs for their various roles with humans. This paper garnered significant attention by the popular press, including the New York Times, the Daily Beast, and Scientific American. But the real highlight of that media coverage was a feature about dog genomics on 60 Minutes, which included a major interview uh, with Elaine Ostrander by Anderson Cooper, who visited her laboratory on the NIH campus uh, to do the filming uh, for the interview. So congratulations to Elaine and to her laboratory for this advance. NHGRI's Intersociety Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education and Genomics, or ISCC PEG, facilitates student interactions with healthcare and education professionals working in genomics. Three years ago, ISCC PEG created a scholars program which provides trainees with exposure to the broader genomics community and one-on-one -on -one interactions with experts in the field. And over a two-year term, these scholars work on a genetics genomics-related education project under the mentorship of an ISCC PEG member. And the first class, whose term ran from December 2020 to November 2022, presented their work uh, this October. So the program then selected two new scholars in December. Both are genetic counseling um, or students, so they're in genetic counseling programs. Um, Ava Willerborough from Ohio State University and Molly Felix at Virginia Commonwealth University. And finally, um, some things to say about our intramural program and sort of all things sort of come around. We're bookending this with retirements. We heard about major retirements in our extramural program. Yes, our institute is at that age. We have similar retirement bug that has hit the NHGRI intramural research program. And once again, there are three I'm going to tell you about. So Joan Bailey Wilson recently retired after 27 years at the Institute. Joan led a highly successful program that used statistical genetics to determine the genetic underpinnings of multiple types of cancer. She served as a co-branch chief at NHR for many years, was passionate about helping trainees flourish under her mentorship and launch their careers, and she published over 240 papers throughout her time as an active researcher. Another long-term branch chief, Dave Bodine, also retired from NHGRI recently. He first joined NIH as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, but then joined our intramural research program in 1993 when our intramural program first formed. His work advanced the field of genomics and hematology, for example, by identifying the genetic factors involved in blood disorders like diamond blackfin anemia. In addition to his scientific achievements, Dave actually holds the record for the most Mentor of the Year awards at NHGRI. And finally, Jim Mulliken retired from NHGRI after 25 years at the Institute. Jim worked on the Human Genome Project at the Sanger Center uh, before I successfully convinced him to come to NHGRI and bring his geno genome sequencing expertise to the Institute, which he did in 2003. In 2009, I handed the baton uh, to Jim, and he became the director of the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center. And under Jim's guidance, uh, NISC, as it's known, evolved with modern technologies and aided countless genomics projects at NIH. A few notable examples of Jim's collaborative scientific work included his involvement with the International HapMap Project, the ENCODE Consortium, and the Androthal Genome Project. Chuck Venditti was recently appointed to be the new chief of NHGRI's metabolic medicine branch. Chuck is a talented medical geneticist and has been at NHGRI for nearly 20 years. 
He actually started as a member of the Physician Scientist Development Program and later transitioning to an investigator position in 2008. And since the last time we met, NHGRI's intramural research program has, of course, been very productive um, in many publications, and we always like to just highlight a few. Uh, Susan Persky and her group used virtual reality simulations to investigate how clinicians might use polygenic risk scores in medical care. They found that medical students who received additional genomic information made different clinical recommendations to the virtual patient depending on the patient's race. Les Biesecker and his group assessed 13 NIH studies that used a genotype-first approach to patient care, which involved selecting patients with specific genomic variants and studying their traits and symptoms. The researchers found that this approach uncovered new relationships between genes and clinical conditions, broadening the traits and symptoms associated with known disorders and offered insights into newly described disorders. And finally, Andy Baxavanis and his collaborators identify a new set of genes used for colony formation in a saltwater invertebrate. These invertebrate genes are similar to genes involved in human immunity, actually, specifically the histocompatibility complex, lending new insights into the evolution of the immune system. And finally, and this is the, the end, um, I want to leave you with a recommendation on how to improve morale among your trainees at your research institutions. Now, our intramural training office noted that ever since the pandemic started, our trainees were not getting out of the laboratories as often and interacting with other trainees across the institute, especially because our intramural program is located in multiple buildings across the NIH campus. So recently, um, the office staff held a week-long event where my cardboard self, looking like Waldo, was placed at a different location around the NIH campus each day. A photo of Eric as Waldo at that location was emailed to all the trainees. And if they could correctly identify the location and then come there in person to mingle with other trainees, they then received a baked treat and they had the chance to be photographed with cardboard Eric. And as you can see, this was a smashing success. I am convinced that the few hundred dollars used by our communications group to make that cardboard Eric was some of the most morale-enhancing money we could ever spend. And so to that end, I'm going to make a recommendation that each of you council members, and even others who are watching, is that you should go and do the same thing at your institution. You should go get photographed, make a cardboard replica, and have your training group do this. I am sure every member of council would be a smashing hit with their trainees. Could you imagine all the trainees flocking in droves to be photographed with a cardboard Laura? Or a cardboard Stephen? Or of course, a cardboard Gail? And th there'd be crowd control problems with cardboard Hal, just no question. So please let my communications folks know if you need advice about how to create and, and manufacture such a cardboard replica of yourself, I highly recommend it. And I will come to a close by reminding you that, as I always end my director's report, we have a very user-friendly one-stop shop for staying connected with the Institute and with me by visiting this webpage through the indicated URL and scrolling down. Um, you can get past a picture of me and get to this nice menu of nine major resources. It includes the genome.gov website, the Genomics Landscape monthly newsletter, of course, my Twitter feed, but it also includes convenient links to our 2020 strategic plan, our brochure, that wonderful talking glossary of genomic and genetic terms I told you about, our building a diverse genomics workforce action agenda that Vince Bonham is about to talk about, the Genome TV channel YouTube, and a history program's uh, set of oral histories. And if, you're, if that doesn't satisfy you enough and you want more binge watching, scroll down further, you'll find some talks that I've given recently. And if you really just want to read instead or listen, podcasts of mine and some op-ebs are there as well. So please stay connected with us. Um, and, and use this uh, site as a way to do it. Finally, a personal thanks to the dozens of NHGRI staff members who contributed the slides and associated materials that I just reviewed. As always, it takes a group to make this happen. A lot of information just conveyed. Um, when we, of course, we also couldn't do this without our Office of Communication staff for creating the electronic resource. And then, of course, there's always the special thanks to my usual ringleader, uh, Chris Wetterstrand, who coordinates all of this. Um, shown here, um, um, she's in the back row right there. This is the Office of the Director Staff and a couple of very suspicious looking cardboard Eric's here as well. Uh, I don't know what it is, but those cardboard Eric's sure do get around. 
And with that, I will stop and turn things back over to Rudy. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any questions for Eric and the, about the director's report? Any early orders for cardboard cutouts that people want to get in the pipeline? All right, so our, our next uh, agenda item is a presentation by Vance Bonham, and I think you were going to handle this introduction, yes. Eric. 